Hello students of Psych Assessment, uh, PSC 5080. This is week two recorded lecture. Uh, and I'm your professor, uh, Dr. John. Uh, and uh, this evening, uh, we're going to be doing a bit of review. I kind of feel like I'm going to get run over. What the heck? Some guy at Mammoth coming down the hill. I got to get this off of here. Uh, he's got his tongue out. That's That should be illegal. Um, let's choose something a little tamer. Uh, here we go. How about um, how about that? All right. Yeah. Oh, feel much more comfortable right now. I uh, hope things are going well for you guys. I know that we've had a lot of problems with Q Global, and uh, more than three quarters of the class is all set to go. They've taken at least one assessment. Uh, in my previous classes, although we've had some hassles with Q Global, not as difficult as this one. Um, not your fault. Uh, it's entirely the system's fault. Um, everybody has been able to take all of the assessments. So if you're one of those people who has not yet got it down, uh, make an appointment with me and we will walk through the process together. Okay. Um, today is going to be uh, pretty much of a review. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I uh, like to quote Donald Hebb all the time, uh, morons that fire, morons that fire together, die together. Wait a minute. That's not it. Not morons that fire together. Uh, neurons that wire together, fire together, if they fire often enough. And that means some repetition. Uh, so this will be a review of some of the things covered last week, uh, maybe from a slightly different angle or with different pictures anyway. And also much of the review uh, covers the uh, some of the content in chapters three and four in the reading. So here you have a picture of some neurons uh, with axons uh, reaching out to, for a, to a dendrite to another uh, cell body forming the synapses, uh, the billions of which make up our uh, complex of synaptic connections uh, in our brain. There are more connections in the human brain than there are stars in the universe. Uh, that's a lot. Um, psychometric qualities. Uh, look at the peacefulness on this child's face, just loving it. No sympathetic arousal right here. Uh, secure child, eyes closed. Uh, now, I would like you to close your eyes and try to think of what are psychometric qualities for a moment. Just uh, close your eyes and try to think of them. If you came up with reliability, validity, and clinical utility, you knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, can you define them? Think about that for just a second. You betcha. Hey, these guys have a happy look on their face. They look like somebody on Jeopardy who knew the answer to double Jeopardy and uh, just wagered their entire take um, to uh, in an effort to uh, win the round. Uh, you betcha. All right, let's find out how your definitions in your head stack up with the definitions uh, that I would like you to learn. Okay. Here is the definition of reliability. I will not read it to you, but it is measured in three ways. And uh, you see them right here. Test retest is simply what it says. You give the test to someone today, a couple of weeks down the road, if not a lot of things have changed, and you give them a test, the test again, should be very close to the original. Uh, Interrater means if I give the test or if, uh, Mrs. Jones from down the block gives the tests. The results should be similar on the same people. That's called interrater. And then split half. And I believe you probably remember that in split half uh, reliability, there's a term called 
coefficient alpha. That is the Pearson's coefficient of correlation of the results of one half of the test to the other half of the test. It's called split half reliability. A good measure for split half reliability is 0.7. The next concept is a little bit trickier um, and uh, validity um, is an easy thing. If you wanna weigh yourself, you get on a scale, it's a valid measurement. Um, uh, however, if you want to measure something like uh, anger or happiness or depression, or uh, obsessive compulsiveness. These things are much harder to define and harder to find ways to measure them accurately. Uh, and that is the problem with validity with psychological constructs. There are at least four ways to measure validity. Content, this one's rather straightforward. If the test contains the actual construct that you are attempting to measure, then that instrument is said to have construct validity. Uh, a very oversimplification would be if you give a math test and you're trying to measure math ability and the test is composed of problems in math, you have what is known as construct validity. Um, ex excuse me, content validity, back up, erase what I just said, and put it under content validity. Construct is very similar if the construct is actually contained in the test. So both of these, content and construct validity, are similar. Concurrent validity means that the test that you are trying to determine whether it's valid or not produces results that are similar to an already accepted instrument. For example, if you take the Stanford Binet intelligence test and uh, you wanted to see if it's valid or not, you might compare the results of that intelligence test to the results of uh, an accepted intelligence test that has accepted validity like the WACE, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. That would be concurrent validity. The other is predictive validity. If you want to measure um, uh, a construct, a psychological construct, if you can predict behavior that is consonant with that particular construct, then your instrument is said to have predictive validity. There's more about all four of these forms and some others of uh, validity in chapter four. Um, the third item of uh, psychometric qualities that uh, you should be concerned with is clinical utility. Okay, how useful is it? Uh, if the instrument has no clinical utility, then why bother with it? But uh, for instance, the Bex depression inventory, a simple uh, test of 21 uh, inquiries, measures the depth of a person's depression. And this will give you some idea about what kinds of therapeutic measures you might take. Clinical utility means that the instrument that you are using gives you some kind of pathway uh, in your therapy, uh, your treatment, or your uh, recommendations. Okay, now we've got some other things here, Noir, Gaussian distribution, normative group, skew, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is the Reader's Digest condensed version of those items. If you take a look at them, uh, NOIR, you remember that NOIR is an acronym that stands for Levels of Data, nominal, uh, no, nominal, Ordinal, Interval, and Ratio. And thinking back to those, you realize 
that nominal and ordinal are discrete data. There are specific bins into which uh, items uh, that you are concerned with will fit. They don't fit in between any item. For example, if you are uh, constructing uh, an illustration of what kind of fruit you find in your neighbor's refrigerators and you're finding uh, apples, avocados, oranges, tomatoes, if you consider them fruit, pears, grapes, uh, whatever, uh, there isn't anything between a grape and uh, an orange. Uh, the grape has its own bin. Uh, each of these fruits has their own discrete bin to go in if you were to make an illustration of the numbers. Um, Gaussian distribution, that's another word for the bell curve, okay, or the normal curve. Uh, it is important because many things in nature are clustered around the mean, and the farther you go above the mean or below the mean, the rarer the scores are. In other words, they fall off. So you find most of the scores around the mean, and the farther you get away from the mean, either in a positive or ne negative direction, you find fewer and fewer uh, incidences of uh, that particular uh, height. Say, for instance, an average height for men might be 5'9". I'm not sure what it is. But if you were to move to the right and the positive direction to, uh, say, uh, six feet, four inches, there are far fewer people at six feet, four inches. And if you were to go still farther and, say, seven feet, uh, most of your you know, many of those basketball players, Yao Ming from China, seven feet, three inches, I believe, uh, you're going to find a very smaller number, a rarer number. And the same happens if you go in the other direction. If you move from 5'9 to 5'2, there are going to be far fewer individuals at that height, and all the way over to, say, 4'8, far fewer. So the whole idea of the normal distribution is that things tend to be clustered around the mean. And as you move either above the mean or below the mean, you have far fewer incidences of the scores or raw measures that fall above or below the mean. Now, the neat thing about the Gaussian distribution is it is actually a curve that's generated by an equation. And we can estimate the percentages of scores that will fall between the mean and one standard deviation above or a standard deviation below. Uh, standard deviation above is about 34%, below about 34%. In other words, 68% of the scores in a normally distributed population will fall between one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below. Now, let me skip down to the very bottom category since I measured variability and there are three measures of dispersion. Dispersion is sort of like uh, how far apart the items are scattered. If you were to look at a demonstration of people clogging up, say, State Street and um, uh, Carrillo Boulevard, uh, trying to make a point about some uh, cause that is very important to them, and they're all standing around shoulder to shoulder in the street. Oh my gosh, that would be pre-COVID, wouldn't it, if they were shoulder to shoulder? Uh, otherwise, it might be a super spreader event. EGADS. But anyway, you have this, just picture this cluster of people crowded together shoulder to shoulder. That would be a very dense uh, distribution. Uh, the uh, standard deviation would be a very small because the distance apart is very small. Now, please come along. Hey, you guys, get out of the intersection. We need you to move. And people don't move and they get defiant. And so the police decide uh, we're going to be 
<clears throat> introducing you to our friend, the tear gas genera generator. And they lob a few tear gas generators into the crowd, hopefully not injuring anybody. And the tear gas, if you've ever been tear gassed, I have been in the army. It is a miserable experience. Your eyes start watering, your nose starts running. Uh, it's, it's just like every uh, mucus producing membrane in your sinus passageways is on steroids. It's a horrible feeling and it stings like mad. So people start to run in all directions. And now what was a densely uh, distributed around the center of that population, the distribution becomes much more widely dispersed. So measures of variability can be viewed as measures of dispersion. And the first one that is most common is the range. And that is simply, if you look at a normal distribution, you take the highest score and subtract the lowest score from it, and that gives you the range. If your highest score is 200 and your lowest score is zero, your range is from zero to 200. Um, now, the next uh, and very um, commonly used measure of dispersion or measure of variability is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is like, it isn't exactly the same as, okay, be careful now, I, I qualified this, but it is very much like the average distance of every data point from the mean. So if you were to look at all the data points in your distribution uh, and you were to average the distance of those data points from the mean, that would be very close to the standard deviation. It isn't exactly mathematically the same because the standard deviation is more sensitive to extremely distant elements from the mean. Um, but it is like the average distance of every data point from the mean. So if you have a low standard deviation, your stuff is clustered around the mean and you have a distribution that is tall and skinny. Um, and, but after they lob the tear gas, you have a standard deviation that is much higher. And so you have a Gaussian distribution that is lower and wider with a higher standard deviation. So which distribution would be taller and skinnier? One with a standard deviation of two or one with a standard deviation of 10? If you are following along correctly, you would say the standard deviation of two uh, is characteristic of a deviation that is tall and narrow. And the standard deviation of a distribution, uh, if it is 10, you have a lower and wider distribution. Both are considered normal distributions, uh, a normal uh, curves, but they have different standard deviations. You can have distributions that have the same mean, median, and mode, but have a different standard deviation. Okay, so that's uh, measures of variability. They go up one, tick one up to central tendency, and um, you see central tendency, there are three measures of central tendency, as you remember, and perhaps you were able to watch that little ditty that I suggested to you uh, about the mean, median, and mode. If you go to YouTube and just in the search engine put down a song about a mean, median, and mode song, it's a rather silly, very simple song about mean, median, and mode, but it serves as a good um, review of what we learned back in grammar school and middle school and high school and in our BA program and now again in the master's program about the measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode. Measures of central tendency are simply an attempt to represent a distribution with one number. In a symmetrical distribution, one that you could fold in half, there would be a mirror image, one side a mirror image of the other. In a symmetrical distribution, 
the mean is the best measure of central tendency. However, um, if you have skew in a distribution, which, for instance, if you looked at the population, not the population, the median income of all the people, the mean income of all the people in Santa Barbara, you got some very wealthy people in Santa Barbara living in Montecito. You got Ty, Ty Warner, you got Oprah, Win, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Christopher Lloyd. Uh, these people have incomes in the millions, and they are certainly way far above the mean in very rare territory. However, if you include them in a distribution of the salaries, the meat of the incomes of people in Santa Barbara, you're going to have what's called a skewed distribution. You would look at the positive side of this uh, distribution and you would pull the tail in the direction, uh, in this case, in the positive direction. Uh, if the tail gets pulled off in the positive direction, it's called positive skew. Now, what happens to the mean when you do this? the mean gets pulled in the direction of those outliers. So the average income, the mean income in Santa Barbara, if you include these outliers in your uh, figures, would probably be something, I'm not, I don't know what it is, but it might be something like $650,000 per household. We know that is not representative of Santa Barbara. Uh, at least not Santa Barbara, I know. Um, so if there are outliers in a distribution, if they're on the positive side, they pull the tail in their direction. And along with it, they drag the mean in that direction. So the mean no longer becomes a good measure of central tendency. However, there is a number that is better, and that is the median. The median is simply if you line up all your scores from lowest to highest, you find the one that is exactly in the center. With an odd number of scores, you will have one right in the middle, and that will be a better representative number of a better measure of central tendency for a skewed distribution. If you have an even number of data points, you simply average the two numbers that are closest to the center. You add them together and divide them by two. Okay, now the other measure of central tendency is simply the mode that is the most occurring data point in your distribution. In a symmetrical distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are exactly in the center in the same place. However, in a skewed distribution, the mode will be over the highest point followed on the other side by the median, and the one pulled closest to the outliers will be the mean. Okay, You can see an illustration of that in last week's PowerPoint, which I will post after I post this uh, recorded lecture uh, so that you can take a look at it. I'll post also the PowerPoint that I'm using for tonight in the resource section. Uh, at least one of you had requested that I do that, and I did say I would do it. Thank you for the reminder. Don't ever hes hesitate to ask me to remind me to do something that I said I would do. And now there's one more uh, thing on this slide uh, here, and that's uh, z-scores. Don't panic about z-scores. Uh, z-scores are simply a way of comparing apples to oranges. Now, here's a simple definition of a z-score. This course is not going to be math heavy, by the way. Z-scores are simply the distance of a score from the mean in units of standard deviation. Again, a z-score is simply the distance of that score from the mean in units of standard deviation. Okay? All right. So this is a bit of a review of some of the things that we had studied last week or looked at, and also some of the things that are in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. Now, we have had a heck of a time 
getting everybody onto Q Global. As of now, we have more than three quarters of the class already have them taken um, at least one assessment. If you are one of the uh, people who are having a struggle with Q Global, email me. We will go through the process of getting you into this together. Okay. Everyone in my previous psych assessment classes has been able to take every one of the instruments that we've uh, been uh, making available uh, to everybody. And once we get this thing mastered, we will have confidentiality. No one's information will be visible to anyone else's, which is a good thing. So um, thank you for your patience in mastering this stuff. Now, you know that uh, there's a summation assessment in this class. It's called a mock assessment. And uh, the mock assessment is something that you're going to do. You're going to construct a fictitious assessment of a movie character. You have lots of room for creativity in this assessment. I have a video in the resource section. I think it's called the mock assessment a video assist. Please view that. It will explain a lot about this assignment. And don't panic about it. It's not due until December 3rd. But the reason I mention it now is I would like you to start thinking of what movie character you want to utilize. And there's a few of them down there for your consideration. Um, the more obvious the pathology of your movie carrier, character, the easier this will be, okay? So if you're interested in a, uh, you know, um, bipolar disorder, uh, Richard Gere in Mr. Jones might be of interest to you. Uh, there's uh, Temple Grandin, if you are interested in the uh, autism spectrum. It's a marvelous story uh, based on a true, uh, a true series of events, uh, a, a real life Temple Grandin. Uh, and then uh, Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man, Rain Man, Rain Man with uh, Tom Cruise is also uh, very interesting about an autistic savant, uh, very capable in a narrow range of mathematical uh, cognitive uh, abilities, but unable to read emotions or understand uh, things like uh, facial expression. Um, so think about what movie character you would like to use, because as you go through these assessments and you take them, you may find, oh, this one would be good for this character. And you might start thinking about the ones you're going to use uh, in your mock assessment. The mock assessment is uh, well described in the uh, detailed description of weekly activities uh, in the syllabus. And now in week three, you guys have, who've been able to do so have taken the MMPI and the SCL 90. If you haven't been able to do so, don't worry, there will be no lateness penalties for not getting them done in the week that they are assigned. But I do want you to take all of them. Uh, the MMPI and the uh, SCL 90 are looking for pathology, but in the third week, you're going to be experiencing the quality, the quality of life inventory. This is an instrument used in positive psychology, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy that one. It's a little, it's refreshingly different. Now, if you don't know what pathology you've got in front of you, both the MMPI and the SCL90 do what's called casting a wide net. They are sensitive to a wide variety of pathological syndromes. And so if you don't know what's going on with a client and you have maybe some suspicions, but you would like to have these suspicions perhaps um, uh, supported by an instrument, the MMPI, or the SCL90 is an instrument that casts a wide net um, and uh, might be a good one to use in your 
mock assessment. Now, here's a website that I would like you to look at that has information about uh, the SEL 90. It's on Pearson's page. You probably won't be able to copy and paste from this Zoom recording, but uh, I I think you will be able to copy and paste from the uh, PowerPoint that's in the resource section. So uh, after this video is, uh, this um, recorded lecture is over, you might go to the PowerPoint in the resource section and uh, uh, ferret out this slide and copy and paste the website there and take a look at what Pearson says about the LCL 90. There's a lot of information on their website. Same thing for the MMPI. Uh, there's a website there that you will be able to copy and paste from the PowerPoint uh, at the conclusion of this lecture. Take a look at it and see what Pearson's has to say about the MMPI. I have mentioned it before, uh, the MMPI is the most researched instrument on the planet. It has really good psychometric qualities. Uh, and um, it's, it's quite something, it's an assessment on steroids. Okay, I seem to have lost a slide or two. My goodness, I didn't save them apparently. Well, let me stop this share. And uh, so you have down the road your mock assessment, uh, be thinking about what movie character you want to do in your mock assessment. Um, uh, and uh, be thinking about what kinds of assessments might work for the pathology that you're seeing there. Uh, there's, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, some people like to choose uh, a pathology that they have interest in, uh, in doing the mock assessment. You have a lot of room for creativity there. Uh, so please uh, let your creative juices flow when you put together that mock assessment. Also, if you're having any difficulties getting registered with Q Global, please uh, contact me and we will go through the process together. We'll get you going on this thing. Don't hesitate to email me with any questions that you have, uh, any concerns. I'm happy to uh, Zoom with anyone who's got any apprehensions about being able to uh, get things done in good form. Uh, I will help you. Uh, my goal is for you to be successful uh, and to come out of this course with uh, an idea about some of the most popular instruments that are available to you and have some idea of psychometric qualities, um, uh, some idea of the very basic statistical information that is valuable to you in interpreting the results of these assessments. Probably one of the most important concepts is the normal distribution and the idea of a normative group. When anyone publishes an assessment, they choose a large group of people to take this assessment, and then they use the scores as a normative distribution to compare other people's scores too. Now, if your client is not represented in the normative group, that instrument is inappropriate for them. Now it has happened uh, here at Antioch. We have many students from Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, and other countries as well, but they have some cultural propensities that are different from the cultural propensities that are represented, represented in some of the normative groups for uh, some of these assessments. And so uh, the results will not be accurately interpreted for those clients, or for those individuals. Remember also that it's very different in using the assessments as we are doing to just familiarize you what is out there and familiarize you what it's like to be an assessee 
It's very different than using an assessment to help you confirm uh, a diagnosis with a client who has come to you with a difficulty, okay? These assessments are designed, most of them, not all, to ferret out pathology, and they'll sometimes come up with results that are disquieting for you personally. Uh, you don't have to agree with them, for heaven's sakes. Um, if there's anything that is very upsetting to you, you should take the results to your therapist and discuss them with them. Uh, those results are probably spurious. Uh, I have admitted to smoking marijuana on some assessments. And so usually in the narrative, it will say, perhaps I have a substance use disorder, which I don't. Um, so take the results with a grain of salt. Sometimes you may find something that is insightful, that will help you understand yourself. And uh, sometimes you will agree with the results and sometimes not. So please keep that in mind. Um, let's see, what else have I got for you? I think that's about it. Don't hesitate to email me. Ask for a meeting with me if you don't understand something. If you have questions about anything, need clarification or help, uh, I'm here for you. We can have a private Zoom meeting. So do go to the PowerPoint after this uh, short uh, little uh, lecture and uh, find the um, websites for the SCL90 and the, SC, uh, the MMPI and click on them and just peruse them, take a look at them, uh, and uh, it will give you a little bit more information about those two assessments, which uh, three quarters of you have already uh, taken at least the MMPI, and many of you have taken both the MMPI and the SCL, SCL90. All right, you guys take care. I do apologize. I didn't have any jokes this evening. I think some of you have told me that I shouldn't quit my day job anyway. So um, no jokes this evening. Although, um, you know, yesterday I drove past a dental clinic and outside, there was a line of guys, all leather jackets, colors, uh, motorcycle uh, affiliations, flying their colors. Their, their motorcycles all custom uh, lined up on the road for uh, many, many, many parking spaces. Uh, they were all going to the dental clinic to um, have their choppers checked out. Someday you'll forgive me for that. Okay. Take care. Virtual hug to every one of you. Uh, be safe. Email me if you have any difficulties. Take care.